Hello everyone, this is Mr. Millette with an AP European History presentation. Today's presentation is all about the age of imperialism. One of the most significant consequences of the first and second industrial revolutions was the great division they created between the world societies that did industrialize and the world societies that did not industrialize, or industrialized in minimal amounts. While much of Europe industrialized and some selective non-European societies industrialized, a host of the world's societies remained industrially underdeveloped. This underdevelopment left these societies vulnerable to the economic, cultural, and militaristic expansionism of the industrialized European states. It is in this context that many of the industrialized powers of the 19th century would come to dominate and exploit the non-industrialized societies. This presentation will focus on the motives for what was essentially a second wave of European empire building and maintenance. Additionally, this presentation will analyze the characteristics of, responses to, and consequences of the age of imperialism. At the end of this presentation, you will be expected to be able to demonstrate your understanding of these three learning objectives. One, explain the motivations that led to European imperialism in the period from 1815 to 1914. Two, explain how technological advances enabled European imperialism from 1815 to 1914. And three, explain how European imperialism affected both European and non-European societies. To help set the historical situation of the age of imperialism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it is useful to juxtapose this age of imperialism with the previous age of European expansion of its first maritime-based empires. Let's first take a look at the differences between the two ages. Notice the circuit dates I've selected for these two ages. These dates are in no way absolute and definitive and are certainly up to historical debate and varied interpretation. I've set the first phase of maritime empire building between the circuit dates of 1500 and 1815. I've set the second phase of the Age of Imperialism between the circuit dates of 1815 and 1914. However, in my interpretation, I see these circuit dates to be validated by the political and technological transitions the world would begin to experience in and around the year 1815. I would also suggest that the Age of Imperialism picked up its intensity and geographic reach later in the 19th century although its roots may be found in and around the 1815 mark. During the first phase of maritime empire building, it was a phase characterized by European leadership in exploration and expansion. European states, while they explored oceans and eventually established their first maritime empires between 1500 and 1815, tended to concentrate the development of their settler colonies in the Western Hemisphere. Of course, that did not mean European maritime empires did not exist in the Eastern Hemisphere at all. Portuguese, Dutch, French, and English trade posts were established throughout the Eastern Hemisphere well before 1815. Additionally, the Spanish colonized the Philippines well before the 1815 mark. However, the general trend was the overwhelming concentration of colonial empire building in the Caribbean and the Americas of the Western Hemisphere between 1500 and 1815. As far as the Eastern Hemisphere was concerned, during the first phase, European states sought direct access to coastal markets in Africa and Asia. Whether Europeans had to fight for that access or were granted access through negotiations with African and Asian states. In terms of the relations between any two or among all of the participating European states in the first phase of maritime empires, there was little to no cooperation among them for the overseas access points, territories, and resources. However, after 1815, with the initiation of the Age of Imperialism, a lot of industrialized nations, like the European states who continued with their global maritime empire expansionism, and the United States and its manifest destiny, colonization of the Age of Imperialism tended to be concentrated in the Eastern Hemisphere. Due to so much of the Western Hemispheric societies having gained their political independence during the Age of Revolution prior to 1815, the Eastern Hemisphere 
was about all that was left for these expansionist states to try to take. Also, beyond the desire for their imperialistic states to merely have access to postal markets, in the age of imperialism, the desire was to gain direct access into the interior of African and Asian societies, even if it meant they had to militarily defeat established states and their governments. Although rivalry among the imperialist powers existed in the age of imperialism, an us-versus-them mentality emerged and at times allowed for the imperialist nations to cooperate with each other in their picking apart of the vulnerable, lesser-developed Eastern Hemispheric societies. This will be seen in the Berlin Conference as it pertains to the exploitation of Africa and the open-door policy as it pertains to the exploitation of China. Although there are great differences between these two phases of expansionism, there are some significant points of comparison between them. Between 1500 and 1815, one of the main economic motives for expansion was the acquisition of staple and luxury crops and resources that were in high demand. Goods and resources demanded by agrarian and mercantilist societies included gold, silver, sugarcane, spices, and cotton. After 1815, as industrialization progressed, the demand shifted to include diamonds, petroleum, rubber, tin, and other industrial metals and mineral resources. Of course, that in no way negated the continued demand for previously mentioned goods and resources. As well in both phases of expansionism, racial motivations existed, especially as it pertained to the labor systems that accompanied the building and maintenance of the empires in both ages. Exploitation of labor sources based on ideologies of racial superiority and inferiority made transatlantic African slavery a characteristic of the first phase of expansionism. While similar sets of racial ideologies characterized the practice of African and Asian indentured servitude throughout the age of imperialism. Similar cultural motives existed between the two phases as well. In the first phase, the impulse of Christian mission outreach sought to Christianize and pacify non-Christians in order to quell resistance and strengthen their own empires. In the second phase, or the age of imperialism, the cultural motive was to provide civility to the lesser developed societies by introducing imperialistic culture, a sort of humanitarian approach. The more dominant expansive states justified their takeover of underdeveloped societies as a means of upgrading and civilizing them. One of these racial and cultural ideologies would be known as social Darwinism, something we will take a deeper look at later in this presentation. Finally, in both phases, nationalistic rivalry was a common characteristic, as imperialistic states frequently competed with each other over a greater share of the resources and profits generated from underdeveloped distant lands. The next several slides presents the locations in the Eastern Hemisphere that were most targeted by imperialistic nations during the age of imperialism throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. This specific slide shows the increase in European imperialism throughout Asia during the age of imperialism. Note the key to the bottom left of this slide. So you can see the array of European states that came to dominate the politics, economics, and in some ways, the culture of some of Asia's oldest civilizations. First, indicated in the sort of salmon color, you can see the British Empire's continued expansion in India, South Asia. Also, the British forcibly opened up China during the Opium Wars between 1839 and 1842, bringing some of the major port cities, including the island city of Hong Kong, as spheres of influence under British imperial control. Next, the French Empire, indicated in a moderate shade of purple, would expand in the Southeast Asia, establishing French Indochina, where the modern nation states of Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam exist today. The Dutch Netherlands, indicated in a shade of brown, would continue their expansionism into the islands that make up Indonesia off the coast of Southeast Asia. You can also see that non-European states that had become industrialized and imperialistic 
also joined in on the great game of the age of imperialism in Asian societies. For example, the United States indicated in a lighter shade of purple would come to dominate the Philippines after successfully wresting the islands away from Spain in the Spanish-American War. Japan, which underwent great political transformations in its modernizing efforts, also became the most industrially developed nation in the Far East. Japan, indicated in orange, would come to dominate lands in Korea and other parts of Northeast Asia, and the island of Taiwan, through success in the Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War. Africa, which was a source of the transatlantic slave trade that Europeans expanded and exploited prior to 1815, for the most part kept its European colonies along its coastlines. The British, indicated in purple on the map to the left, had gained direct access to coastal African regions in West Africa, South Africa, and even North Africa along the Mediterranean Sea coast. The French, indicated in brown, had even fewer trade posts and colonies than their English counterparts, mostly relegated to coastal West Africa and North Africa along the Mediterranean Sea coast. The Portuguese, the first of the European states to establish colonies in Africa, held on to their coastal colonies of Angola and Mozambique. However, after 1884 and the Berlin Conference, European imperialism in Africa intensified as European states sought direct access to the interior of the African continent. The map on the right presents this intensified European partition of Africa, as the vast majority of Africa's interior came under European control. The English, indicated in green, the French, indicated in brown, and the Germans, in orange, along with a host of other European imperialistic states, came to dominate Africa's coasts and its interior. The Pacific Ocean, or Oceania, would also come under the control of the more dominant imperialistic nations. The English, indicated in green, established its colonies in Australia and New Zealand, along with a host of islands that they would come to control in the age of imperialism. Additionally, the Dutch, French, and German nations would also come to dominate many of the islands of the Pacific. Industrially advanced states were drawn to the lesser developed societies of Asia, Africa, Oceania, and to an extent, even Latin America, for their resource-rich environments. As advanced states experienced new demographic and consumption patterns, Demand for resources and products reached unprecedented levels. Ultimately, those demands along with the industrial capitalism that guided the developed world's new patterns of production and consumption contributed to the development of the global economy that would come to exist between 1750 and 1900. The need for raw materials for factories, and increased food supplies for the growing population in urban centers of the industrialized world led to the growth of export economies around the world, specialized in commercial extraction of natural resources and the production of food and industrial crops. In return, the profits from these raw materials were used to purchase finished goods. Examples of resource export economies included Egypt's cotton production and its supply to England rubber extraction in the Amazon River Valley in South America, the Congo River Basin in Africa, and French Indochina in Southeast Asia provided a local economic basis, but enabled the imperialistic states to dictate and exploit the production and distribution. Other examples include the palm oil trade in West Africa, the guano industries in Peru and Chile, the cattle and beef industry from Argentina and Uruguay, and diamond extraction from southern and central Africa. Industrially advanced states were also drawn to the lesser developed societies of Asia, Africa, Oceania, and Latin America because they were capable of practicing a degree of economic imperialism over societies in those regions. This economic imperialism also contributed to the development of the global economy, 
that would come to exist between 1750 and 1900. More specifically, great imbalance of economic benefit, weighing heavier on the side of the industrialized states and the economic exploitation weighing heavier on the side of the lesser developed societies. In some cases, imperialism did not have to result in the lesser developed states' government being replaced. Instead, feeble governments in lesser developed states were oftentimes retained by imperialistic states because they could negotiate economically beneficial terms in unequal treaties, which practically gave them a red carpet to their resources and their markets. Two places where this economic imperialism happened often were in China and in the newly independent states of Latin America. We will focus on the case of China a little later in this presentation. However, in this slide, we will focus on the economic imperialism that imperialistic states like England and the United States practiced in Latin America. Latin America had underwent its independence movements from Spain in the early 1800s, but their political independence did not always correlate with economic independence. In fact, in many ways, these newly formed Latin American states remained vested in their traditional economic practices, which were typically primary resource and product production. Although local production and consumption was necessary in the newly formed Latin American states, the new political and economic elites within Latin America saw those traditional economic practices as a means to make profit in the global economy. They knew that their profits were dependent on their ability to sell their products to more advanced nations like the United States and England. Since those states were industrialized and the demand for industrial goods and resources was higher than ever, Latin American governments stuck to metal and mineral resource extraction, commercial production of staple and cash crops, and cattle and ranching industries. The increased commercialization of these traditional economic practices kept Latin American societies from advancing and modernizing in other industries and relegated them to an economically dependent existence on the more advanced economies of the United States and England. 19th century ideologies were definitely at play and contributed to the development of imperialism. In fact, a range of political, cultural, religious, and racial ideologies were used to justify imperialism. For starters, the 19th century was characterized by an age of nationalism, and nationalism as an ideology helped to motivate people and governments to expand their nation's political, military, and economic developments. Nationalism was the ideology that contributed to nations like England, France, Germany, the United States, and Japan to see expansion as a representation of their nation's strength. Nationalism helped to create national identities for citizens who felt a greater connection to, accessibility to, and participation in their nations and their governments. It bred patriotism and love for one's national identity, as it contributed to breeding distrust and contempt for others with different national identities. Nationalism also bred competition among the most industrialized states, and oftentimes that competition actualized in the form of economic and military competition over disputed and contested lands and resources. The more the various imperialistic states competed with each other over the distribution of Asia's, Africa's, and Oceania's lands and resources, the more vulnerable those regions became to European takeover. Another ideology of the 19th century that contributed to the acts of imperialism was social Darwinism. An English philosopher named Herbert Spencer coined the term in the late 19th century. The 19th century was a great time of discovery in science and medicine. For example, theories regarding human and animal species and their origins came out of a century of great study and observation by evolutionary biologists. Charles Darwin, who gave the world the theory of evolution, that is, that every organism on Earth gradually evolved from a pre-existent species to its current state of existence, explained the continued survival and evolution of some species and the demise and extinction of others. Darwin explained how animals within the animal kingdom evolved over time so as to adapt to changing environments, and how those animals that did not evolve eventually became extinct. 
As much as evolutionary biology and Darwin's theories challenged traditional conceptions of divine human, animal, and earth creationism, they were accepted within circles of scientists and other intellectuals. One such intellectual, Herbert Spencer, utilized Darwin's theory of evolution and applied it to human societies. He wrote, the path of progress is strewn with the wrecks of nations. Traces are everywhere to be seen of the slaughtered remains of the inferior races. Yet these dead people are, in very truth, the stepping stones on which mankind has arisen to the higher intellectual and deeper emotional life of today. In essence, Spencer believed that the most evolved of the human species were the ones who were the most advanced in technology, weaponry, politics, and intellectual pursuits. Existent inferior races were underdeveloped in their technology, weaponry, politics, and intellectual pursuits. Social Darwinism would soon become the ideology that justified industrialized and imperialistic states to take over the lesser developed societies of the Eastern Hemisphere. The justification was that the more developed states were actually helping the lesser developed societies to evolve more rapidly and to achieve a higher level of civility than they were capable of in their primitive existences. It bred a racially condescending humanitarianism that was sold to the societies that were conquered that it was their benefit that was the priority. That masked humanitarianism would soon unveil itself in the brutal exploitations of land, resource, and people that the age of imperialism was notorious for in Asia, Africa, and Oceania. Nonetheless, social Darwinism's contribution to the imperialists' views of their own racial, biological, and cultural superiority led to a great diffusion of their religions, languages, and lifeways into Asian, African, and Oceanic societies. And those indigenous populations oftentimes witness their own religions, languages, and lifeways replaced. Beyond the motives and the ideological justifications, imperialistic nations during the age of imperialism were equipped with an arsenal of enabling factors that put them in advantageous positions and situations to dominate lesser developed societies. Both the first and the second industrial revolutions really allowed the imperialistic nations to technologically advance and become equipped with an arsenal and a toolbox for more intense empire building. For example, innovations in energy like steam power, electricity, and petroleum enabled even more innovation in transportation. Industrialized states who constructed railroads and produced steamships to move goods, resources, and to people within their respective nations took their shipbuilding and their railroad infrastructure to the lesser developed world that they sought to include in their empire. Under the disguise of look at the wonderful transportation and energy technologies we can provide you and your society, imperialistic nations gained unprecedented access to populations, resources, and markets in the interiors of Asia and Africa. For example, English capitalist and industrialist Cecil Rhodes who established the South African colonies of Northern and Southern Rhodesia, financed extensive railroad construction throughout and across a lot of the African continent. Masked by a phony obligation to bring railroad and steam power to Africa, Rhodes exploited diamonds and diamond mining labor to make his fortune. Additionally, innovations in military transportation and weaponry also enabled imperialistic nations to expand their reach into Asian, African, and Oceanic societies. Imperialistic states and their militaries were equipped with more mechanized transportation and weaponry than the underdeveloped societies they sought to dominate. Gunboats, ironclad ships, rifles, and eventually the Maxim gun enabled imperialistic states to quickly disarm resistant governments and groups within the underdeveloped world. The English utilized their gunboats when they seized China's Grand Canal during the Opium Wars between 1839 and 1842. The Qing Dynasty, unable to prevent the English from trafficking illegal opium into China, desperately tried to negotiate with England's monarch, Queen Victoria, and her parliament. England, who had long established itself in India and the island nation of Sri Lanka, exploited the land and resources of South Asia including tea, spices, 
cotton, and a recreational drug that was produced from the commercial production of the poppy plant, opium. England's control of opium production in South Asia and its control of opium distribution in China would result in a great Chinese addiction to smoking opium. Opium addiction led to an array of negative social and economic consequences for Chinese men and their families. Addicts abandoned their responsibilities to job and family and did anything they could just to get their opium fix. Opium had a detrimental impact on Chinese men continuing to walk the path of Confucianism and filial expectations. When the Qing dynasty threatened to confiscate English opium and imprison English opium dealers, English military advanced against them with their gunboats and seized the Grand Canal. By 1842, the Qing dynasty had surrendered and entered into the treaties with the English. The ensuing imbalanced and unequal Treaty of Nanjing of 1842 granted the English most favored nation status, extended the English extraterritoriality to its merchants who could no longer be arrested for breaking Chinese law, granted numerous additional ports for English merchants to dock, and handed over the island city of Hong Kong to the English. The Treaty of Nanjing was an immense step in the direction of imperialistic nations carving out their respective spheres of influence in China's interior and on China's coast. Advancements in weapons enabled greater consolidation of power for the imperialistic states as they came to dominate Asian, African, and Oceanic societies. Paradoxically, in Europe, there was a relative period of peace that French historians refer to as La Belle Epoque, or the Beautiful Epic. With few exceptions, between 1871, the end of the Franco-Prussian War, and 1914, the outbreak of World War I, European states remained relatively peaceful inside of Europe. So why the urgency to advance and mechanize weaponry? For the purpose of European imperialism abroad. In 1884, the same year the Berlin Conference and the Scramble of Africa began, Hiram Maxim invented the Maxim gun, a belt-fed automatic firearm that was utilized to defeat resistant African armies as Europeans gained more and more control over the African continent. Rifle technology also advanced, as in the case of the improvements in the breech-loading rifles, like the French Chaspeau and the French Mini Rifle and Mini Ball. These advanced weapons made it nearly impossible for indigenous populations to successfully defend themselves from imperialistic European states. Innovations in communication also enabled greater consolidation of power for the imperialistic states. The telegraph not only allowed for transcontinental communication across Europe and across North America, but by the mid-1800s, transoceanic telegraph communication had become a reality. The first transoceanic telegraph communication was made in 1858 between the United States and England. In an approximately 100-word message that took 17 hours to transmit, President Buchanan and Queen Victoria made the first transatlantic telegraphic correspondence in world history. From that point forward, both England and the United States, along with their respective militaries, especially their navies, would build transoceanic telegraph cables. These telegraph cables had to be coated and insulated in rubber casings. Rubber was a major product that was exploited in and extrapolated from French Indochina and Southeast Asia and in the vulnerable independent states of Latin America. These transoceanic telegraph communications enabled the English, the American, the French, and eventually the German navies to dispatch naval orders and other necessary correspondence that enabled them to patrol and maintain their transoceanic empires. Another innovation that enabled the imperialists to exploit land and resource was the building of artificial canals. The best example of this occurred in Egypt, where the French and the English took an interest in digging out the Suez Canal, connecting the Mediterranean Sea with the Red Sea. The English and the French contributed to the engineering and design of the Suez Canal, but it would ultimately be the English who would reap the political and economic benefits of the canal. Egypt, which had recently underwent an intense movement of nationalism 
and had gained its independence from a dilapidating Ottoman Empire, found itself vulnerable to English expansionism. The English, through the Suez Canal, made Egypt a military protectorate. Basically, that meant that Egypt could retain its own government, but it was under the complete military protection and patrol of the English military. Having unbound access to the Suez Canal, the English Navy used the canal as its lifeline to India, the Indian Ocean, and ultimately to Australia and New Zealand. No other imperialistic state had achieved such imperial access and control quite like the English had with their control of the Suez Canal. Arguably, just as enabling as the technologies associated with weapons, transportation, communication, and infrastructure were to the imperialistic states, the relative political cooperation that took place among the imperialistic states put the underdeveloped world at a severe disadvantage when it came to defending themselves from takeover. The best example of this political cooperation among imperialistic states has to be in the decisions that were made at the Berlin Conference in 1884 and 1885. Berlin, the capital city of a recently unified German nation who was leading Europe's second industrial revolution, played host to this multinational conference that included representatives from most of Europe's advanced nations. Presiding over the Berlin Conference was the German Chancellor and the original architect of Germany's unification, Otto von Bismarck. Bismarck and the other European representatives arbitrated the partition of Africa. With not one single African leader invited nor present at the Berlin Conference, Bismarck helped to serve up each European nation's desired peace of Africa's land and resources. This ensuing scramble for Africa over the next 30 years brought 99% of Africa's land and people under varying degrees of European control. The European partition of Africa would not have meant much if European explorers, settlers, capitalists, missionaries, and soldiers could not survive in the interior of Africa. Prior to the Berlin Conference, Africa was regarded by most Europeans to be a continent of savage peoples, wild beasts, unforgiving wilderness, and a disease-breeding death trap. One African disease that struck fear into Europeans was a mosquito-based disease called malaria. Malaria may have actually been a practical reason for the Europeans to remain content with coastal colonies and trade posts prior to the age of imperialism. However, as Africa proved to be much more than a continent of savages, beasts, unconquerable wilderness, and disease-ridden and mosquito-infested lands, Europeans changed their perspective. Petroleum, diamonds, ivory, and industrial metals attracted Europeans to the interior of Africa. But one thing that stood in their way was malaria. During the 1800s, a treatment for malaria was discovered. The cinchona tree, a plant native to South America, introduced to Europeans via the Columbian Exchange, became the source of quinine, a treatment for Africa's killer malaria. Once Europeans could manage malaria, the interior of Africa was theirs to take, and they would hold it well into the 20th century. Much like the European partition of Africa after the Berlin Conference, the imperialistic nations would seek to carve their desired portions out of a continuously weakening China. The Qing dynasty, who failed to industrialize and modernize its society and its technology, infrastructure, and military, continued to succumb to encroaching imperialists. The English had started this process with the Opium Wars and the Treaty of Nanjing. But by the end of the 19th century, the French, German, Russian, American, and Japanese militaries had set their eyes on their respective desirable pieces of China. China began to be carved up into spheres of influence, among the most powerful of the imperialistic states. And even when the Chinese attempted to resist imperialism, it only resulted in swift and severe suppression of the resistance and consequential increases of imperialistic control. Initiated by the United States as government, the open door policy would be enacted to forge cooperation among the imperialistic nations and their pursuit of their pieces of China. Ultimately, the open door policy led to even more increased imperialistic presence in China as the Qing dynasty waned and weakened 
more rapidly in the first decade of the 20th century. There were various political processes that resulted in the power shifts within imperial states as they intensified their imperial control in Africa, Asia, and Oceania during the age of imperialism. For example, some imperial states like England, Belgium, and the Dutch Netherlands had initially allowed private companies to establish trade posts and colonies. However, as tensions mounted between those private companies and the indigenous populations, and as profits showed greater potential, many of those private companies would transfer their colonial authority to their respective states. This was so in the case of the British East India Company, when the 18th century had established its trade posts and footholds in India. Ultimately, as their presence increased and tensions mounted between the British East India Company and the local peoples and princely states of India, the British government saw no other option but to transfer the company's holdings and make India a royal colony in the late 19th century. Similar actions happened with the Belgians in the Congo, as King Leopold II made the Belgian Congo a royal colony in Africa. Likewise, the Dutch East India Company, which had originally established its trade posts and footholds in Indonesia in the 17th century, would have its authority transferred to the Dutch government in order for the Dutch government to exploit the land resource and people more effectively. These transfers of power often resulted in more brutal labor practices, more harsh and direct colonial systems with brutal punishments to subject colonial peoples. As in the case of the amputated African workers from Belgian King Leopold's Congo's Free State in Central Africa. A greater disregard to subject colonial people's quality of life, as in the case of Indians who suffered famine in British India, with little to no relief efforts provided by the British imperial government, and a general greater exhaustion and exploitation of land and resource. Although England, the Dutch Netherlands, and France were originators in maritime-based empire building, and maintenance in the early modern period, and were able to continue to expand their empires during the age of imperialism, not all originators were able to do so. For example, the Spanish and the Portuguese empires and their influence declined, while the other European states' empires grew during the age of imperialism. For Spain and Portugal, they never really recovered from their losses of their Latin American and Caribbean colonies in the early part of the 19th century. Along with that, Spain and Portugal also lost many of their trade posts and footholds in the Indian Ocean complex to the Dutch, French, and English. Additionally, the Spanish and Portuguese gained virtually no new territories in the scramble for Africa after the Berlin Conference in the late 19th century. Worse, for the Spanish, they would lose the Philippines in their loss in the Spanish-American War between 1898 and 1901. On the other hand, England, France, Germany, the United States, and Japan all increased their empires by acquiring territories throughout Asia and Oceania. For example, the United States pressed beyond its original goals of manifest destiny in reaching the Pacific coast and expanded into the Pacific Ocean. The United States not only brought the Philippines under their control, but also brought the Hawaiian Islands, Wake Island, Guam, American Samoa, and Midway Island under their control. Not all imperialistic states had to cross vast oceans to expand their land holdings during the age of imperialism. Rather, some imperialistic states conquered neighboring territories. For example, Russia continued its imperial expansion into Central Asia. It even competed with the English and the Qing Dynasty of China in its expansion into Central Asia. Japan increased its land holdings by defeating China in the Sino-Japanese War in 1895 and acquired the island of Formosa, otherwise known today as Taiwan, and other regions of northern China. Japan also increased its land holdings in Northeast Asia as it defeated Russia in the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. Japan would continue its imperialistic aggression in Korea and in Kamchatka throughout the early 20th century. The increased economic, cultural, and military presence of imperialistic states in Asian, African, and Oceanic societies rendered varied responses by indigenous populations that were subjected to foreigners, either directly or indirectly. In some cases, increasing discontent with imperial rule led to rebellions 
within the most vulnerable, underdeveloped societies, as in the case of the Taiping Rebellion in China or the Kosa cattle killing movement in southern Africa. China's Taiping Rebellion between 1850 and 1864 was a rebellion that targeted the Qing dynasty, which was perceived by the Taiping leadership as weak, corrupted, and puppeteered by the British and other foreign imperialists since the end of the Opium Wars. No doubt the Qing dynasty had some problems, including natural disasters, famine, and increased occurrences of peasant rebellions. Additionally, the Taiping also developed a great distrust for the Qing. Since the dynasty was a foreign or non-Chinese origin from Manchuria, the Taiping leader, Hong Shiquan, was a disgruntled Chinese subject and a failed statesman since he failed his civil service examination multiple times. In his defense, the pass rate on those civil service examinations was extremely low. After having visions of God, yes, the Christian God, Shaquan propagated a notion that he was a reincarnate of the brother of Jesus Christ. He used his radical fanaticism in the greatest attempt in Chinese history to lead a rebellion to overthrow an established Chinese dynasty. His goal was to overthrow the Qing dynasty and rid China of all foreign devils, Westerners and Manchu alike. After 14 years and millions of Chinese soldiers and subjects killed, the Taiping Rebellion was finally put down by the British. The Taiping Rebellion exposed the weakness and the dependency on foreign military protection that the Qing dynasty had, and it allowed for the British and other Western imperialistic states to cash in on China's vulnerability. The Kosa cattle killing movement between 1856 and 1857 was a rebellion that targeted British imperialism in Southern Africa. British imperialism was becoming overwhelming in Southern Africa, and the different African societies took to their own traditional methods to try and prevent continued British imperialism into the region. The Kosa were an indigenous African people in the region whose livelihood was predominantly characterized by pastoralism and cattle herding. They saw the British as a threat to their way of life, their cattle, and their pasture lands. Led by Nowase, a teenage African girl who had visions of ancestors who informed her to begin the cattle killing, instructed the cattle herders to do so. The Kosa commenced to sacrifice their cattle to fulfill the prophecy that if they did so, the British would leave South Africa. The Kosa population declined severely due to famine and a continued arrival of the British into the region. Ultimately, the British would retain South Africa within its imperial system until 1961. As well, the increased economic, cultural, and military presence of imperialistic states in Asian, African, and Oceanic societies rendered responses of direct resistance by indigenous populations, as in the case of the Great Sepoy Rebellion of 1857 in British India or the Boxer Rebellion against foreigners in China. The Great Sepoy Rebellion of 1857 occurred in British India. The Mughal Empire had lost a lot of authority over the course of the 1700s due to both internal and external forces. Internally, the intolerant reign of Aurangzeb turned many Hindu states, like the Maratha Empire in southern India, against the Mughal. Externally, the continued arrival of the British in the form of the British East India Company posed a threat to Mughal authority and sovereignty. In either case, the Mughal Empire seemed under-equipped to prevent either internal or external forces from continuing to weaken their authority. In spite of Mughal efforts to align with the French in the Seven Years' War between 1756 and 1763 against the British, the Treaty of Paris in 1763 granted an immense amount of territory and authority to the British East India Company. It is at that point when the British East India Company began to use sepoys, predominantly South Asian Hindu and Muslim mercenaries, to help protect and secure their interests in the region. Continued and increased British presence in India led to many Indian grievances with the British East India Company. Forces of Westernization, imposed British land acquisitions, increased Christian missionaries, and increased overtaxation generated tension between Indians 
and the British. The last straw was this training regimen that the British put its sepoys through in 1857. That regiment included the sepoys buying off the caps of the shells before loading the British rifles. Those shells and caps were coated in a substance made from animal lard, specifically beef and pork. Since beef was a dietary restriction in Hinduism and pork was a dietary restriction in Islam, the sepoys took the opportunity to fire those rifles at their British training officers. This sparked the Great Sepoy Rebellion against the British East India Company. The Great Rebellion gained momentum as the Mughal Empire, under Bahadur Shah II, gave his support to the sepoys. However, the British military was deployed to swiftly put down the Great Rebellion. In effect, the Mughal was officially overthrown in 1857 and India became a royal colony of the British Empire and would remain under direct rule until 1947. The Boxer Rebellion of 1900 in China involved a peasant uprising that targeted a multinational coalition force of nine different states. The Boxer Rebellion was anti-imperialist, anti-foreign, specifically anti-Western, and was anti-Christian. Continued environmental and demographic problems such as drought and famine plagued late 19th century China. The continued loss of the Qing Dynasty's political and economic sovereignty pervade an uneasy and vulnerable existence for the Chinese peasants. As well, the continued increase of foreign presence due to the open-door policy between China and the United States resulted in the boxers militarizing against that foreign multinational coalition. The Society of Harmonious Fists, or the Boxers, were predominantly made up of working-class peasants from coastal cities in China. Eventually, the Empress, Dowager Sishi, would give her support to the Boxers in an effort to curtail increased foreign influence. Much like the Great Sepoy Rebellion in India, the Boxer Rebellion would be put down swiftly and severely. Although Sishi's position was retained and the Qing Dynasty spared, it would be just a few years later in 1911 when the Qing dynasty would succumb to a nationalist revolt and would be thrown out of power, ending nearly 4,000 years of Chinese dynastic history. Imperialism did not render solely violent resistance movements. In fact, some subject colonial peoples attempted to negotiate terms to limit the reach of foreign imperialism on their culture, populations, and environments. The best example of this sort of cooperative rejection of imperialism was in the development of the Indian National Congress after India became a royal colony in the second half of the 19th century. Filled with many westernized Indian colonial subjects who learned the English language and even attended English schools and universities, the Indian National Congress looked to gradually take over control of India. Unfortunately for the Indian National Congress, it failed to prevent the severity of negative economic and demographic consequences caused by faulty British policies. Indian poverty and starvation plagued the landscape, and as the 20th century began, the Indian National Congress was merely a recipient of India's westernization rather than a preventive measure against India's westernization. Imperialism was not just disputed by those that were victimized by its exploits. Back in Europe, not all leaders and influential individuals were in favor of Europe's imperialism abroad. English Prime Minister William Gladstone, who served in that position under Queen Victoria for 14 years in four different terms in office, was a political liberal who campaigned against the imperialism of his political opponents. Gladstone, in a speech in 1879, condemned England's increased imperialism, stating, quote, Remember the rights of the savage, as we call him. Remember that the happiness of his humble home. Remember that the sanctity of life in the hill villages of Afghanistan, among the winter snows, is as inviolable in the eye of Almighty God as can be your own. Gladstone often feuded with Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, a staunch supporter of England's imperialism. Disraeli promoted imperialism in a speech from 1872, 
When you return to your counties and your cities, you must tell to all those whom you can influence that the time is at hand when England will have to decide between national and cosmopolitan principles. It is whether you will be content to be a comfortable England, modeled and molded upon continental principles, or whether you will be a great country, an imperial country, a country where your sons, when they rise, rise to paramount positions and obtain not merely the esteem of their countrymen, but command the respect of the world. Ultimately, the age of imperialism contributed to so many alterations in our world that it is impossible to quantify. However, many snapshots of our world's cultural, linguistic, religious, ethnic, racial, and economic characteristics are predicated on the alterations caused during the age of imperialism. The legacies of the age of imperialism are complex, and the historical debate about whether or not imperialism helped or hurt the world is just as complex. Without a doubt, the age of imperialism left the following legacies. The drastic alteration of Asian, African, and Oceanic environmental landscapes, including railways, plantations, industry, mining zones, deforestation, resource extraction, and canal building. The reintroduction of semi-coercive labor systems like British indentured servitude and the use of Indian contract laborers. The mass migration and settlement of Europe's and Asia's laborers, impoverished, displaced, and persecuted peoples. The increased tensions between and among imperial powers. In the case of the Boer Wars between the British and the descendants of earlier Dutch settlers, known as the Boers, in South Africa, the increased naval arms race and militarism between England and Germany. The establishment of the modern racial ideology of social Darwinism and the racism, eugenics, and inhumanity it justified. The continued economic backwardness, industrial limitations, and exploitation of colonial peoples, lands, and resources. And the intensification of nationalism self-rule, and the desire for independence within colonial societies.